Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. I hope you found uh, Berkeley lunch options to your tastes. Unfortunately, the sunny weather doesn't help us getting people back in the room, um, but we expect everyone will make their way. My name is David Ackerley. I'm a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology and one of the scientific organizing committee, along with Steve Beisinger, for the, today's summit well, and tomorrow. Uh, I'll be the moderator for the afternoon session, and it's an honor to share the stage with a really distinguished group of speakers this afternoon. The title of this session is Stewardship of Parks in a Changing World. We're all well aware that humans represent the preeminent ecosystem engineers on the planet, and really few places or no places on Earth will escape the impacts of climate change and its cascading effects, as well as invasive species, habitat loss, and all the associated challenges to our natural world. Our speakers and panelists this afternoon will explore these changes and the challenges they present for stewardship of parks. In our strategic conversation that wraps up the session, we'll discuss the changing palette of conservation strategies in the coming century and the crit critical role of science for parks and parks for science in a changing world. And I just want to remind our audience, both here and online, you can submit questions by email, the science for parks at berkeley.edu and here in the in-house on the uh, note cards as well and pass them forward. And short questions have a much better chance of being asked. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ruth DeFries, Professor of Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Ruth was a pioneer in the use of remote sensing to evaluate global land cover and its role in the climate system and in the development of a systems level perspective of human populations in a landscape context with research foci in Amazonia and India. She is a recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Award, member of the National Academy of Sciences, and co-director of the undergraduate program in sustainable development at Columbia University. Ruth's talk today is titled Beyond the Boundaries, Parks Within Coupled Human Natural Systems. Ruth, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the organizers for this very stimulating and exciting conference. What I'd like to do is pick up on a theme that was alluded to several times this morning by Ernesto and Jane and others, that parks are embedded within larger ecosystems, and our thinking needs to evolve to consider the natural interactions, the social interactions, the economic interactions of those parks with their larger uh, ecosystem. So if I could have an alternative title, it might be this. Look outside of the parks. Or maybe another alternative title. It takes a functional landscape to have a functional park. So I want to build on this theme of this uh, coupled human natural systems in which parks reside. We've seen this before. There was a, a more attractive looking version of this graphic earlier today about the conservation success of the last few decades and certainly of the last few hundred years, where we've seen a large, really impressive increase in the area under protection, and much of this is in the developing world. Whether we can expect that trend to continue is, uh, is, a, is a difficult task, considering the competing uses for land, for food production, for biofuels, for settlements, and so on. Uh, one of the key aspects, I think, for the future is building on this conservation success. How do we ensure that the areas that we do have under protection remain functional? So if there's a take home from what I wanted to say this afternoon was that we've seen in the last 100 years the success in increasing area of protection and perhaps the vision for the future for the next 100 years is to keep our success functional by managing the competing goals, and there are strong competing goals out there, uh, which I'll illustrate in a minute, for uh, conservation, livelihoods, and development in the larger landscape in which parks are uh, embedded. This is not a new idea at all. Uh, going back to the first World Conference in National Parks, this recognition that parks are very rarely large enough to be 
self-regulating to contain all of the flows of water and energy and nutrients and these ecological processes that occur across landscapes. So this was recognized uh, long back. And I would add to this that not only are parks uh, not self-regulatory ecological units, they're also not self-containing social units, that they sit within the political context, the social context, the values that people give to the landscape. Uh, so we have to think about the parks within that larger uh, context. So beyond saying that areas are outside of, outside of parks are important, how can we bring our science to bear on this question? A, a key question, scientific question is, well, what are those areas outside of parks that are really important for the functioning of parks? Parks exist within watersheds. There are migration corridor corridors. Uh, there are people that inter interact. Most of the parks in the world, protected areas in the world, have people living within them, and there are people um, interacting with parks. So how do we define those areas outside of parks which are really critical for functioning of the park? And that's, I think, a, a real scientific question that we're trying to make some uh, progress on. And I want to now turn to an example and illustrate how tightly coupled a human natural system can be in the context of uh, an area where I work in central India. This is the area that Rudyard Kipling wrote wrote about in the Jungle Book, so you can imagine Mowgli and Balu and Shere Khan and Bagheera and all those characters running around uh, this landscape. And it, it's, uh, I'm using this in, as an example because it's so clear how the protected areas are so intertwined with the larger landscape and the decisions made about the larger landscape are so fundamental to the conservation success of the protected areas themselves. I'm also choosing this example because I've just come back from spending several months in this, in this particular landscape, and uh, I spend a lot of time there, and as we heard this morning, um, viewing the world changes your view of the, changes your world view, <laughs> and it certainly does when you get on the ground and uh, appreciate all of the different competing interests for, for land, all of the ways that um, different values apply to how people want to use land and how that needs to be managed and how those different values are all valid. And the goal for us as scientists is to help provide the information that can help balance those, um, those trade-offs and those values. So zooming into this landscape, uh, there are uh, lots of small protected areas. Let me say also that, uh, that another reason for focusing on this landscape is because um, because it's just really, really incredible how much wildlife there is in India in general, in this landscape in particular. This is a globally important uh, landscape for tiger conservation. That's the iconic species here. Uh, and in a country where there's nearly four times the population of the U.S. and one-third the land area, lots of different uses for land, 70% of the population rural, uh, agricultural, uh, that there is the wildlife that does persist in India is really quite a cause for um, celebration, not to say that there are not lots and lots of uh, challenges to maintaining that, uh, that wildlife. But here we have a landscape where there are a, a network of small sort of postage stamp size, very small compared to our national park system um, parks, but based on genetic evidence, we know that there is, for, for tigers and for leopards, uh, we know from work that has been done on genetics, that there, this landscape is functioning, that these um, individuals, some small handful of individuals, are able to move across this very sort of hostile territory, settlements and agricultural matrix and dense human populations, that they are in contemporary times, able to maintain the same gene flow that has been persisting for thousands of years. So something is working in this landscape to maintain that genetic flow. So we want to find out what that is and uh, keep that uh, functional. 
In this landscape, the areas surrounding these um, protected areas, there's all of the traditional pressures that we think about in a developing country context that come from, uh, from poverty. And with poverty comes the dependence, no other option but to satisfy energy needs and food needs and water needs from the local landscape. So, of course, there's a lot of pressure for fuel wood collection, for grazing livestock in the forest, for small scale, low productivity um, farming that encroaches into, the, uh, into habitat. So all of those traditional pressures are there. It's tempting to say that the, uh, the local population lives in harmony with, um, with nature and all of those nice romantic notions that we like to have, but our evidence really does suggest otherwise, that uh, by measuring the biomass and the tree diversity and the abundance of tree species, that it's pretty clear that um, human population density, livestock density, intensity of use, using the forest for construction materials, for local construction, for fuel wood, all of those uses really do have an impact on the forest, which can lead to these heavily, heavily degraded forests like you can uh, see here. So you can imagine that that's not a very nice um, habitat for prey and up the food chain to the tigers and the, uh, and the leopards. So there's a lot of pressure on this landscape from local uses. And the, the people who live around this landscape are really paying the cost for the conservation that we all value. We heard this morning about the conflicts between wildlife and people in the Yosemite, conf Yosemite context. Uh, in this context as well, there's massive conflicts between wildlife and uh, people. The most dramatic is the livestock kills, the predation on uh, cattle. Here's some work to attempt to map, this is around one particular protected area, to map the risks of predation to be able to uh, inform management about where mitigation measures might be most effective and cost effective to, uh, to implement. There's also a lot of local resentment, as you can imagine, with, uh, with the, the um, killing of livestock and raiding crops and so on. This is a famous tiger, this is a star, his name is Jay. And he is famous because he traversed some very hostile agricultural territory between two protected areas to make it into, make it into safety, kick out the dominant male and become the dominant male in, that, uh, in this landscape, in this protected area. He subsists completely from cattle. He doesn't go for the ungulates. He doesn't go for the wild prey. He goes for the cattle um, that belongs to the people outside of the park. And he is even known to have taken out uh, cattle as they are pulling a bullock cart. So he is quite bold. And this is from just the other day, March 16th, was in the newspaper. And these, these events are often in the, in the local papers and the national papers as well, that, uh, that the villagers, um, they do get compensated. There are compensation schemes. But they have uh, clearly don't appreciate this situation very much. They don't appreciate Jay. And there have been known retaliatory uh, killings of, uh, of the... Uh, the uh, carnivores. So that is a definite risk that Jay is running there. There's also even less dramatic but more pervasive the, the price that the local people pay for conservation that we value is the, uh, the rating of their crops. Wild boars are the biggest offender, the ungulates, the monkeys. There's massive, uh, massive crop rating and loss of crops. Again, this is a, a attempt to do a, a risk map of where that crop rating is most pervasive, again, to consider mitigation measures like fencing and so on that might be able to, to manage this conflict. This is not a conflict that can really be solved. This is a conflict that needs to be managed. So trying to think of the science that can help with that, uh, that management. So those are the sort of traditional pressures 
on parks that you might think about in this developing country um, context, the fuel wood gathering, the, the local reliance on resources, and so on. But that's not really what I wanted to focus on here. I want to focus on the growing pressures from national development. There are big aspirations for economic growth in India and in many, many, many countries, as there should be. Uh, and this comes with the development of infrastructure, of roads, of rails, of mines. This landscape is situated right at the heart, right in the middle of the country. So there's a lot of transportation networks that go on and moving goods from north to south and east to west. Here is a, a mapping of connectivity to identify those places where the corridors are still, uh, still functional, and to identify, particularly what we're interested in, is to identify the bottlenecks and the pinch points, to be able to say where are the most important places in this landscape to, uh, to maintain this functionality and this connectivity. So, spent the last, <laughs> the last um, few weeks going around to some of these pinch points where our models are saying that's where the, the, the corridors are narrow to, to understand what's going on there and to understand what might be needed for managing those places to maintain that functionality. Come across a lot of interesting things in this landscape. One is that uh, highways are a big push for the current government and as they are throughout the developing world, lots of highway development. There are two particular um, places which have been very contentious, and this debate has been going on for about a decade, at least a decade. This, between these two protected areas, is a very functional corridor. You can see the forest cover there. And uh, between these protected areas is another um, functional corridor between these two. You can see that there are corridors throughout this landscape that, uh, that, that uh, is what accounts for the success with maintaining the genetic flow to date. So there has been a proposal on the books for a long time to widen the highway. It's currently two lane like this, which probably wildlife can cross without too much trouble, uh, but to widen it into a four lane highway, because this is a national highway that is a used by truck, heavily used by trucks to transport goods from uh, north to south. So we have this highway, national highway here and this national highway here. And these two particular stretches uh, have been on the books to be widened for, uh, for quite some time. And there has just been recently been given clearance to widen those highways. So as we speak, these uh, construction is underway in those places. Another pinch point that we visited uh, turned out to be an industrial zone, which was hemming in the, uh, the, the corridor. Coal mines are pervasive on this, uh, on this landscape, and there are soaring energy demands and plans to extract this coal and use it to satisfy these energy demands, as you can imagine. So these, uh, and lots of open surface mines, so that's quite a uh, impact on the landscape as well. Power plants, one pinch point that we visited, we, uh, we came across a newly minted uh, power plant with a very thermal power plant with a pretty large footprint here. So there is no way that, uh, that uh, anyone can quite get across that so easily. Tourism is, has grown enormously in this landscape and in many, many protected areas in India. And this is really a double-edged sword. It's, this tourism is from, um, from domestic, from urban, the growing middle class, and it's really wonderful that, uh, that they can have the means to go visit the, the um, parks and appreciate the rich biological heritage. That's the one side. The other side is the expansion of resorts and lodges and swimming pools and jeeps and all of these things has been um, rapid and not particularly well managed and has, in at least one instance, really severed one of the corridors. So that's another aspect. 
if the, if the Tigers can make it across all of that, the roads, the highways, the rails, the mines, the, the tourist resorts, they might come across something like this, chilies, drying, <laughs> large expanse, big agricultural matrix here. Despite all of that, there still are functional corridors in this landscape. So there's a real opportunity here to use science, to work with managers, to figure out what can work without just saying no to all development, because that does not work. To say no to roads, no to highways, no to rails, no to these aspects, which are really very important for, for economic development, is not a winning argument. So we're trying to use our science to figure out how to um, how to balance these objectives. These, um, these issues are in the paper almost daily, going to the Supreme Court, um, different decisions by different ministries. It's a very, it's a high profile issue, I would say. So I gave that example from India as an extremely tightly coupled human natural system. The same concepts apply to our parks, uh, here and everywhere around the world. So here's an effort by, um, by one of my colleagues to try to map the areas around some of the parks to identify those critical places outside which are important for maintaining the functionality of the park. But that's not so, that's one scientific question, but it's really an extremely complex one that when we think about managing the whole coupled human natural system outside of parks, it's really not business as usual. We have to recognize that conservation is just one concern out of many, and most often the development concerns take the, uh, up, get the upper hand. We have to recognize that this infrastructure development in the developing world is critical, and we cannot just sit back and, and uh, oppose. Um, we also have to recognize that the managers, the park managers don't have administrative control over what happens in the larger landscape. And that really calls for a different kind of science. Uh, how do we use our science to inform um, balancing these different competing objectives? How do we bring in the economics, the, the social aspects, the values, uh, to add to all of the wonderful science that we have inside of parks. So it's really a very uh, complex and challenging problem once we step out of the parks. Parks themselves are complex, and once we step out into the larger landscape, we increase the complexity by leaps and bounds. So just to end where I began, that uh, if we think about the where I see the vision for the future for the next 100 years is... Uh, is in managing these competing goals for conservation, livelihoods, development in uh, landscapes outside of parks to keep the functionality of the conservation success that we have had. So, thank you. I think we'll have time for a couple questions. And um, what I want to start is to ask you to contrast your experience with uh, some of our experience in the United States and to go right to the famous mandate from the Organic Act about national parks is existing to preserve unimpaired for future generations. And really, my question is, in India, what is the philosophical foundation for those parks? Both, and that may be reflected both in the leg legislation, but also in the kind of support that comes from different levels of society. Well, India has a, um, a history of legislation, the Wildlife Protection Act and uh, establishing tiger reserves. So there's a, there's a uh, starting with Indira Gandhi. So there's a history of legislation to protect areas and to um, conserve wildlife, uh, which compared with other places in Asia really is quite remarkable. Um, and one aspect about, uh, about India, and I don't have any qualitative data on this, so I probably shouldn't even go here, but, uh, but there is a um, sort of a deep cultural tolerance and appreciation that, um, that we live with nature, um, and that has very deep cultural roots and really manifests itself in people being pretty tolerant 
to to crop raiding and these big livelihood losses that they they suffer. They're not completely tolerant, but um, just contrasting to some other places, uh, there is this sort of cultural sense that I think that I think we can learn from. And you spoke about there being compensation mechanisms for those losses. Now I think we all. We all hold to the idea that often parks will actually create value, but you didn't speak to any sense that those, are those parks creating any direct value for people in the immediate vicinity, or is it mostly compensating for loss? Um, the tourism is one aspect that can create some benefit, but it's really very localized. So there's such a high population density. So if you think about the whole population living around the park, some people can benefit from the tourism, from the economic activity associated with tourism, and that certainly does happen. But it's not, I wouldn't say that that's a large percentage of uh, the people who are suffering the costs of, uh, of conservation through crop rating and predation and so on. And in terms of the science, you ended by talking about the, there's a chance for a different kind of science that's needed. Do the, do the parks have a role to support the science behind sustainable development? I guess, to turn it around a little bit. Well, the parks have been, uh, the, the forest department has been um, very proactive with corridors. There's a, there's a management plan now for the corridors, um, and they have developed that over the last several years, and they recognize, I mean, it's, it's very obvious in this landscape that the corridors are so critical. So they do recognize the importance of corridors. They have developed a management plan. It is outside, as I said, outside of their direct administrative purview. So they're working with the managers of that landscape to implement the management plan for the corridors. So there is, um, there is this recognition about the, how important the, the larger um, landscape is. It's just a very, very challenging um, challenging to manage, particularly with these competing economic pressures. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I think you've actually set a nice stage because I will be returning through the afternoon to this theme of how parks are embedded in those larger landscapes. Thank you. Thank you again. I'm pleased to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Monica Turner. Professor of Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For many years, Monica has been a leading figure in the field of landscape ecology and the causes and consequences and importance of spatial heterogeneity in landscapes. She has a long history of research in the national parks, some of which she'll share with us today. Monica was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2004 and is the president-elect of the Ecological Society of America. Perhaps coincidentally, or perhaps not, ESA is also celebrating its centennial this year and Monica will take the reins at the 100th annual meeting this summer in Baltimore. Monica's talk today is titled Climate Change and Novel Disturbance Regimes in National Park Landscapes. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the organizers, to Dave and Steve and the others for the opportunity to um, participate in this meeting and, and uh, to address you today. At the outset, I'd also just like to acknowledge my collaborators and co-authors and also recognize the variety of funding sources that have supported the work that I'll be sharing with you today. Now, we've seen this picture a couple of times, this painting from Thomas Moran, and obviously I'm stating what we already here recognize, that national parks really are our national treasures. They are protecting and preserving iconic aspects of our scenery, aspects of our natural heritage, things we really value. As we heard the numbers, I was really struck by the summation of all the uh, um, activities that people, sporting goods and uh, sport activities and Disney and such, that, that uh, the number of visitors to the national parks surpasses that Director Jarvis mentioned last night. But people flock to the parks to see features like the geysers in Yellowstone and the beautiful scenery and the wildlife. So what happens when this happens? We haven't talked about this yet at the meeting, but the summer of 1988, how many of you remember that? So many of you. How many of you were Park Service people at that time? So fewer. So this was a huge challenge, not only to the managers of Yellowstone, but also to the public and to our perception of what is a national park, what constitutes good stewardship, what constitutes impairment. So these fires are, are now widely recognized as ushering in the new era of fire activity throughout the West. And what they left behind was this. Is this scenic? Is it beautiful? Is it normal? Is it natural? 
Was the management of the park at fault for these fires? These are the kinds of questions that were raised by disturbances that, that acutely and very rapidly change our ecosystems. And they've contributed not only to our understanding of how science changes, but also to our understanding of stewardship. And one of my themes is that the science and the stewardship of our parks both evolve together. And in preparation for this meeting, I went back and read some of these earlier reports that have been mentioned. And I would just mention that ecologists for the early part of the century had very much subscribed very much to a balance of nature approach. We thought that ecosystems could be maintained in a desirable but static state. We could keep them there the way we wanted them. And that philosophy, very much reflecting the science of its time, is in the Leopold Report, which states that a national park should present a vignette of primitive America. Now, events like the fires of 1988 and other disturbances that happened throughout the country really challenged our understanding, both in science and in management. As scientists, we didn't know what was going to happen following those fires. But we were growing to an understanding that many systems are not at equilibrium. They change, but they might change within a historic range of variability. You know, they sort of stay put, but they're not static, they're dynamic. And the Risser Report on Science and the National Parks, which came out in 1992, it recognized that directly and said, to conserve ecosystems unchanged is simply impossible. Now, we are facing another round of challenges as climate change accelerates and many of the other disturbances, or not natural ones, but other pressures that are affecting our parks and landscapes. And revisiting Leopold recognizes that we now are facing the, the need to steward the parks in the face of continuous change that is not yet fully understood. And indeed, our science is recognizing now that we have constant change. So this is challenging not only our, our, our stewardship of the parks, but also our basic understanding. So I'm gonna to talk today about Yellowstone because it's a place that I've worked in for many years, focusing on natural disturbances, some of the lessons that we have learned that apply to many of our other national parks or, or wildland areas, climate change and disturbance, what looks ahead, and then some comments on directly to the theme of the meeting. Now, you all know where Yellowstone is, but it is the other Y park, so it's not Yosemite. I'm in Wyoming now. So the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is very big. It includes over 80,000 square kilometers. It's centered on Yellowstone Park proper. It includes also Grand Teton National Park and a variety of other federal lands around it. Yellowstone is dominated by coniferous forests and lodgepole pine, my friend. Some people think they're boring forests, but they're wonderful forests, but dominated extensively also by lodgepole pine. Now, fire is not new in this system, and it's not new even to the people who have been in this place. And I went back and read some of the journals from the early explorers. And Nathaniel Langford ended up being uh, the first superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, but he was the, the person who kept the journal for the Washburn Expedition, which was one of the early explorations of Yellowstone. And in one of the entries, and there are numerous that refer, they say that we broke camp at half past nine in the morning, traveling along the edge of the Firehole River near the rapids, passing thence through a long stretch of fallen timber blackened by fire for about four miles. And it probably looked something like this when they were traversing that area. And actually, I think it was a fire that burned in 1862 because we can go back and, and figure out the origin of the stand of, of trees in that region where that journal went through. So they knew about it, they've commented on it in the past, but nonetheless, when 1988 came along, the size and the severity of the fires are outlined in, in the perimeters here in the red, really surprised everybody, science and management alike. The media decried Yellowstone as being destroyed they burned under extreme climate conditions, and that's important. So they burned under severe drought, very, very high winds. They were not caused by fire suppression. I'll say it again. They were not caused by fire suppression. And I know I'm speaking to an audience that knows that, but I'm always surprised at how that perception continues to this day. Um, they did because they occurred in a national park where we didn't go in and seed, we didn't cut the trees down, we didn't do all sorts of active management. They provided an unprecedented opportunity for scientists to understand what happens in response to these kinds of events. Now, you don't have to read this, they've been well studied and I'm drawing on quite a bit of research that has happened over the past 25 years. <clears throat> 
Now, fire is not the only player. The other big major disturbance is our uh, native bark beetles, Dendroctinus, uh, of the genus. They, but they bore under the bark of the trees. They kill individual trees by girdling them. And Yellowstone, if you've been out in the greater Yellowstone region in the early 2000s, a lot of the forests that you looked at would have looked like this. There have been widespread, extensive outbreaks of native bark beetles throughout all of the western United States, synchronously among different species of beetle and, their host, and affecting their host tree. So this has also raised questions. Is this impaired? Is this good stewardship? Is there something that we have done wrong or differently? So those questions have arisen as well. Now, it's important to note that the beetles are native. They, uh, they're always present, but their populations fluctuate a lot over time. So periodically, they experience outbreaks where the populations erupt. We say they mass attack because they gang up and, and attack individual trees. It produces widespread mortality only of large trees. They don't go after the little ones, and they're not affecting anything in the understory. Again, climate plays a really key role in this natural disturbance too. Stressed trees that are experiencing drought conditions are less able to defend themselves from the outbreak. They're more vulnerable. And then secondly, when winter conditions are especially warm, the beetles survive over the winter time and that sustains the outbreak as well. Now again, given that we're in national park and wilderness areas where we're not going in and harvesting the trees or managing actively, we've had opportunities again to study the ecological effects of another disturbance when we allow natural processes to dominate. We have also been working extensively on these for the past number of years and I'll be drawing synthesis points from there. So what are some of the lessons that have come out of this science that we've done following these natural disturbances? One is that large fires that are infrequent, they re replace the stand, they are business as usual in these kinds of landscapes. We learned that partly by work by Bill Ramey that was science for science's sake prior to the 1988 fires and suddenly became very management relevant that summer and paleo work from Kathy Whitlock and colleagues. But since the ice age ended, the last ice age ended, we have had fires at one to 300 year intervals, large, severe in Yellowstone. And they are driven by climate, not by variations in fuels. Those of you who remember this, the fires even jumped across the, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. So they were not paying attention to small variations in fuel. They burned through forests of all age and structures. We've also learned a lot about heterogeneity. Natural disturbances don't create moonscapes. They create very complex heterogeneous mosaics that have a lot of ecologically important functions. So this picture um, from a helicopter in October of 88 shows the mosaic of the 88 fires. That sets up the structure of the landscape and the forests for the decades to centuries to come. The beetle outbreaks shown here are a much finer grain disturbance because they're, they're affecting individual trees, not the entire, um, all the trees, it's not a stand replacing the disturbance, but that's adding another layer of functionally important heterogeneity. We also have learned that bark beetles don't cause, nor do they worsen wildfires. This has been a topic of quite a lot of interest throughout the West because as the beetle outbreaks progress, they kill the trees, they have brown needles, they are flammable and dry, but they're also starting to shed, and then we progress as we go along. And many people expected that these forests that have been affected by the beetles would just be tinderboxes waiting to burn. Well, the research shows otherwise. So bark beetles do kill trees, they do change the fuels, but the data thus far indicate that fire size and severity remain driven by climate conditions, not by the outbreaks. The other thing I would say is the, the, really the big bottom line is that the forests of Yellowstone have been remarkably resilient to these disturbances. So I took this picture in October of 88. It is color, it's not black and white. And this is what these areas look like 25 years later. The recovery of the forests has been, and all of the natural vegetation, has been robust and um, vigorous. However, what are we looking at when we look ahead? So in the future, if we look at the climate projections, Yellowstone is projected to be a lot hotter and a lot drier. This is one of the nicest ways I have found to show what this looks like. This is the western United States in the forested areas in 1988 with the red colors indicating drought or moisture deficit. So you can see the droughtiest places are centered right on Yellowstone, right where we had the fires. 
When you look at the projections for the latter part of the century, you'll notice that it is redder and much more extensive throughout the western forests. Basically, you can think about this as meaning that the climate that we had in 1988, rather than being the exception, is going to be the norm. That's projected to be the average climate conditions. That has profound implications for natural disturbance regimes. I'll focus here on fire. Um, it suggests that there would be much greater projected change than any of us who had started thinking about these issues in the 90s or the early 2000s had anticipated. So the climate conducive to large fires would be common. It would happen most years. The fire regime would no longer be limited by climate. Eventually, it would have to switch to fuel limitation. And fires would be larger and more frequent than they have for the past 10,000 years. So we're talking about potentially ex taking an excursion outside the historic range of variability. Now, the implications of that for the biota are of keen interest. We don't have the answers yet. These are things that we're now starting to work on. We want to know what might happen, when might it happen, why, what are the mechanisms. And we have started looking particularly at the interaction between the warming of temperature and then the changes, the increases in fire activity, as that would affect the ability of the vegetation to regenerate, because that's the underpinning of resilience in these forests. They, they are disturbance adapted, but you need to be able to reestablish your trees. So three things that we've been focusing on mechanistically are if we have increases in fire frequency so that fire comes back before the trees have had a chance to produce their cones and have a new crop of seeds, we could limit our ability for the forest to recover. If the patches of large severe fire increase and some of the species have to disperse in from unburned forests, that could also limit the ability to regenerate. And then if we have drought conditions following the fires in subsequent years, that would also potentially, even if we have seed availability, uh, limit the reestablishment. So are we seeing any evidence for these kinds of changes thus far? So following the 88 fires, these were long interval fires. There were lots of cones. We had variable but very abundant tree regeneration. Some of the areas that burned in 1988 are now starting to burn again. The 2012 Signet Fire, which occurred in high elevation areas, uh, you can see here the skinny little trees here that burned. These big ones are legacy logs from, from the 88 fires. We found, compared to what came back after 88, a 98% reduction in the tree regeneration. And these trees had not yet been producing their cones. How about distance to seed source? If we look at Douglas fir, one of the trees that has to disperse in, following the 88 fires, these data are from uh, work with Dan Donato, after you get about 100 meters away from a live tree, the amount of tree seedlings that have regenerated drop off substantially. So there's evidence for the, the size effect as well. What about post-fire drought? We initially observed this following fires in 2000. This is the Glade fire which was followed by a summer of drought conditions. 2001 had only a third the precipitation of the 30-year average. And if you account for all the other things that would be comparable, which we've done, we have a 95 or 98% reduction in tree regeneration in those areas as well. So in 2010, so 10 years afterwards, we still don't see very many trees in some of those areas. Um, with a George Melendez Wright Fellowship, Brian Harvey, who just recently finished his PhD in my lab, was able to sample across a wide range of fires, followed by wet or dry conditions, in Grand Teton, Yellowstone, and Glacier National Parks. And I'm just going to point you to just the, neg the, the, the downward trending line here to say that these data are robust, and they show a very strong influence of the post-fire drought, so years subsequent, on tree regeneration. That goes way, way down. Um, experimentally, we're also trying to get at these mechanisms as well. That's a complement to observational studies. Winslow Hansen, a current PhD student, is looking at seed germination in areas that burned and that are recovering under today's climate, as well as places in the landscape where the climate projected in 2050 is observed today. So those are underway. So is Yellowstone in transition? It might be. I suspect that we will see in the future fewer old trees, maybe a greater extensive uh, development of younger forests as, as fires reset succession in these areas, and perhaps a reduction in some of the area of forest as well. 
Uh, we might see increases in some of the open woodlands, Douglas fir or aspen, and expansion of our meadows. Transition is the key word here, I think, rather than destroyed. Yellowstone won't be destroyed. It is still going to have its native uh, complement of biota responding to these changes. So as we move forward, I think parks are going to play an even more important role for science. They give us the places where we can understand processes and responses to environmental change without the confounding factors that we have in so many places. They give us key benchmarks. I think we also have opportunities in our parks to showcase our science more as it's happening. We have a bit of a crisis of scientific literacy in the US. We have visitors who are already and, and a wonderful interpretive uh, program in our parks. I think we should emphasize our science more. We also want to continue science for parks. So questions that are relevant to management do include what the future might be. They apply to other places and parks, like the Bavarian Forest National Park and its beetle outbreaks in Germany. And I think we also have to remember that today's basic science is often the foundation for tomorrow's uh, policy decisions. So we should be encouraging research and, and allowing and strengthening our commitment to it, I think, and allowing for uh, experimentation. So national parks, in addition to being our treasures for scenery and other iconic things, are also our scientific treasures. They've given us a lot of new understanding about disturbances that apply in many other systems. But the rate and the magnitude of change is now challenging us again as scientists and park managers, much as the 88 fires did. I think they remain still our best living laboratories for understanding change. And personally, for me, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to study them. Thank you. Monica, you, you uh, brought up resilience, which has become um, a, a bit of a holy grail for management in a new world. <laughs> and I want to uh, maybe pose the, I won't say whether I hold this view, but maybe some do. But even resilience sometimes seems to be not that much of a shift from an equilibrium view because it's still about returning to a pre-disturbance state or recovery. Is, is it really up to the task of ecosystems in transformation? in change as a conceptual foundation? Yeah, I, I think it is in the sense that we, what we want to do is understand the conditions and the reasons that allow for a return of the same category of system. You might still see changes in the species that are present and in their relative abundances, but does the system still behave in a similar way? I, th I think it does, but then we also want to understand what causes tipping points to be exceeded. So under what conditions in Yellowstone, for example, might we see a shift from a forest ecosystem to a non-forest ecosystem. So I think that the concepts and the theory are extremely useful if we think through the reasoning for why and under what conditions and where in the landscape we might see these different pathways taking place. I think we may be mistaken if we think we can manage for resilience. I think we may have to understand it and plan for some of the changes, but I'm not sure that we can quite manage for it. And that's where I, I think it may be a little bit of a holy grail that we can't achieve. In some ways, it seems like fires are the moment that may trigger transformations. I mean, they often are. And mm -hmm. as you said, if a different system returns. So at what, what kind of research would be needed for the Park Service to manage for transformation, to say the path the path of least resistance for this ecosystem is not that the lodgepole fine forest comes back. And there's another path that we can embark on and embrace and say, that's, that's OK. Yeah. So I, I, I think that the, with the Park Service, when I think about managing for response to fire, I, I guess I still subscribe to a hands-off um, approach. So I'm not in favor of having the parks introduce, uh, say, ponderosa pine to Yellowstone, because it might be better adapted to the future. I think we want to still be able to observe how the system adapts, because I think it'll surprise us. And I'm not sure that we know enough to go in and be heavy handed about that kind of management. When I have been speaking a lot with, with some of the, the staff in, in Yellowstone and in other places, one of the things I do try to reassure people about is that when we see changes happening, it's not going to be uniform across the board in Yellowstone or anywhere else. I don't think we'll necessarily lose our dominant tree species. Whitebark pine is a question. But the topographic complexity 
and the time uh, dimensions of, of the successional processes, I don't think we understand well enough yet, and, and, and I don't think we want to assume that everything is gonna be gone. I don't subscribe to that. So the, we, we often hear that uncertainty is an obstacle mm -hmm. to moving forward. As a, as a scientist, what can we offer? Is, is reducing uncertainty fundamentally a research goal that we need to focus on, or is it much more about managing in the face of in, somehow embracing that uncertainty, but still being able to move forward. Yeah, I think it's embracing the uncertainty, not, 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 not actually trying to reduce it. And as a scientist, I think we need to use all of the tools in our, our weapons or tools in our toolkit or weapons in our arsenal to our understanding of these kinds of changes. And so I, I think we need a, a set of studies that include the observational studies that allow us to say, is there evidence for any of these things working or changing now? Um, we need to continue the long-term monitoring. I think that's actually important to see how our systems are changing now. But we also need to recognize that we're gonna to have to model some of this stuff. The time dynamics are such, particularly with forest ecosystems, you know, they take decades or centuries to develop. And with our modeling tools, I think we can put probabilities much better around some of the outcomes. But this is where I feel like these issues are challenging us as scientists just as much as they're challenging the managers because we don't have the answers to that. Um, I also think it's critical that we focus on the post-disturbance landscapes because, as you mentioned, they are likely going to be the events that trigger the, the really quick change because adult trees can withstand quite a bit of variation in the environment and they can withstand greater change than the young trees of the same species will be able to establish in. So I think that, that the parks should be paying very close attention to any of the indicators of change that follow disturbance. And to wrap up, any comments on how the National Park Service and the Ecological Society can embark together on their second 100 years? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a nice coincidence that both are on the centennial. So there, there's two things that, that uh, I think would be particularly fruitful for both sides. One might be, and this is, I'm, I'm brainstorming, this is not an official ESA pro, uh, proposal <laughs> in any way, but I would love to see a partnership between the National Park Service and ESA to offer perhaps internships for some of our early graduate students when they're still getting their feet wet into research and they could be providing research services that help the parks as well. And then secondly, we've heard a lot about communications here and I think that's critical. The parks are wonderful at that and I think that we could be learning to uh, be bilingual, as Jane had said earlier, by really learning a lot from, from the parks, from the interpreters. They're some of the best storytellers that we've ever had. So getting them to include more science and getting us to be able to tell stories better would be, I think, a win-win. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you and Hugh can have it out over coffee about monitoring. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Daniel Simberloff, professor of environmental science at the University of Tennessee. Dan began his career with the first experimental studies of island biogeography theory, which went on to serve as a foundation for what was then a nascent field of conservation biology. His research has impacted many fields of ecology, and he's also been somewhat re relentless, some might say, in his pursuit of the application of the best science to policy in many arenas. Dan has served on the Federal Invasive Species Advisory Council and played a key role in the issuance of Executive Order 13112 by President Clinton, establishing a federal regulatory basis to limit the introduction and the enhanced control of invasive species. Dan's talk today is titled Biological Invasions in the National Parks and in Park Science. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, David, and thanks also to the members of the steering committee for inviting me. It's a very exciting conference. I've already learned a huge amount, and um, I, I'm very grateful to have been invited. Um, as is well known, the, um, the founding of the parks wasn't uh, in any way for science, uh, and it, it, it didn't have anything to say about uh, biological invasions. Of course, the, um, you know, the idea of natural curiosities and their natural condition could be interpreted that way, but nature it was all about tourism and nature was construed as scenery. 
Um, with the American Antiquities Act, which established national monuments, um, this introduced what turned out to be a persistent sort of schizophrenia in the National Park Service um, attitude and treatment of invasions because uh, it, it, it's said to preserve uh, historic landmarks, et cetera, uh, many of which had uh, introduced plants for landscaping or other reasons in the era that was to be <laughs> preserved. Uh, the Organic Act, um, again, it did talk about wild life, the natural, et cetera, leaving them unimpaired. But on the other hand, it didn't say anything specific about non-native species, and it granted the privilege to grave, graze livestock <laughs> in, the, um, in the national parks. So it perpetuated this sort of schizophrenia. Um, I guess it, uh, it, this manifested itself um, most obviously in the introduction of fishes for sport fishing. First, I guess in 1881 with um, rainbow trout into Yellowstone, but soon thereafter into all the major parks. Uh, crater, formerly fishless Crater Lake, um, Glacier, Yosemite, Sequoia, et cetera. By 1920, you know, Yellowstone had four introduced species of trout. It wasn't only uh, fishes. Um, Sequoia had Chinese pheasant, it had turkey. Many of the parks had plants for landscaping or for forage at, at times. So uh, there were a lot of deliberate introductions in the parks. And this led in 1921 to um, resolutions by the then very young Ecological Society of America and the considerably older uh, AAAS um, opposed, pointing to this as a problem, citing uh, some research showing inimical ecological impacts and saying it has to stop. And the, uh, the Park Service responded, um, Horace Albright, this, this statement, and then when he was director uh, this statement saying, yes, we're, we're going to do this, but they gave tremendous leeway to the uh, uh, superintendents of the individual parks, many of whom continued to introduce fishes and plants and occasionally other things. And as scientists within and outside the Park Service complained, um, Stephen Mather and then Albright um, uh, didn't act on the complaints and supported the superintendents. So this went on and on and on. Um, then the, uh, the Wright Report, which is referred to in your program and others have pointed to here, in 1932, very uh, forcefully pointed to this, uh, this problem and said, we have to do something uh, about this. Um, uh, but it didn't really happen. There was a response by uh, then uh, director uh, Arno Kammerer in 19. 36 saying, yes, we will try to do something about this. Um, but there was still introduction of fishes and of plants and probably of other things. Uh, however, in the 1920s, that was the beginning of activities to remove um, non-native species from parks. So uh, burrows uh, from Grand Canyon, uh, European wild boar and boar pig hybrids from Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And it's interesting that the parks initiated uh, in the 20s and, and uh, continued in the 30s really good science to show the impacts of these introduced species. Um, and for example, impacts of the uh, burrow demonstrated very clearly that was used uh, by the parks to defend successfully against a lawsuit by the funds for animals um, to, uh, tried to keep them from shooting out burrows in Bandelier National Monument and Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, there was the very good uh, research on, on boar, but it didn't really lead to any policy change. Um, yeah. So the, uh, the Le Leopold report that you can read about in your program and several people have already mentioned, um, this was 1963, the Leopold report, again said 
uh, even more forcefully that this is a problem that the, um, this continued granting of leeway uh, to individual park superintendents who kept introducing species and weren't really acting to remove them too much has to stop. And uh, in response, the administrative policies for natural areas is probably the strongest statement. It says we're going to do something about them and not introducing them. We're going to try to eliminate them. And in fact, um, this really was the beginning of, of a, a wholehearted good faith effort to do just that. Sometimes it took a longer time and there were some local issues, but there was subsequently then serious attempts. So by the end of the 1960s, there had been at least um, 30 um, uh, projects in the parks to eradicate introduced plants and at least nine to um, eradicate um, introduced animals. And again, these spurred, there were, many were controversial, especially the ones to remove animals because uh, either animal rights people or hunters wanted uh, to maintain mammals, especially in invasive mammals. So again, this led to a lot of good research by park scientists or by academic scientists working with park scientists in the park. Sometimes um, it, it led, it, it eventually it almost always led to policy changes and removal of the uh, mammal. Sometimes it led to odd things like uh, excellent research in the um, 1960s on continuing research on the, the many, many impacts of European wild boar in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, even on uh, many plant species of, of, of major conservation concern. So there, there was no question that the science supported it, but the, the hunters of North Carolina were so adamant that they needed the park to have boar to as a breeding ground for boar to shoot that. The Park Service then shot out as many as they could of the boar on the Tennessee side, but did nothing to the ones on the North Carolina side. So these odd anomalies. But eventually, they, they tried to keep them out as much as possible everywhere. Um, another example of a controversy was to get rid of goats in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Hunters didn't like it. You can see they. You know, put this advertisement in the newspaper, don't cooperate with them. And the uh, park superintendent and the uh, NPS director at that time supported the superintendent, um, uh, didn't act, therefore, on plans to fence them out and, uh, and then try to shoot the, the others. He, um, the the, super, the um, uh, National Park Service director came up with this uh, at, um, uh, claim totally unsupported by any evidence that the goats were helping to suppress exotic plants. But again, eventually this was solved and certainly by 1980 they had done the fencing, shot out as many goats as they could and had it under control. Um, park science began in 1980, a specific park science. Within one year it became a uh, national journal. It's, it's interesting about that year, 1980, it's a little before um, the real initiation of modern invasion biology and the explosion of uh, research papers and interest in the problem. So here you can see it took off in the mid to late 1980s in the wake of the, uh, the SCOPE project. Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment had what we would now call work, ongoing working groups, a working group for a few years on invasions and, uh, and their impact. And park science came along right about that, that time. As you can see, uh, it was aimed originally at park managers, heavy emphasis on management. Um, it was really, and it was uh, stated by the director at that time, that this was to further the uh, objectives of the cooperative park studies units that were to bring together park scientists and managers and university scientists to uh, bring about more effective management of invasives. And throughout its, um, its lifetime, up until today, it's, it's always had lots of articles on, not only on management of uh, invasive non-native species, but, but on um, just their biology and on their impact and 
factors that bring them to the parks, et cetera. So the, the journal itself had tremendous vicissitudes in frequency of appearance, number of pages. The red line is the total number of pages through the years. And the, but the blue line is the, um, the number of articles about introduced species. So far, there have been 222 of them. So it's been a major component of the uh, journal, which is interesting. And you know, sometimes it's even dominated. So in 1981, there were only 52 pages in the journal that year, there were 10 different articles about introduced species, about you know, you know, burrows and, and kikuyu grass and, and um, Klamath weed and, and sheet grass and small Indian mongoose, uh, rats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, uh, and research in the parks really, um, by academic and by park scientists, played a, a, a very major role in the early explosion of interest and uh, in invasions and recognition of the problem. So in the scope project that uh, really founded the modern field, there was a paper uh, in, both, in both volumes actually, by, there were papers by Peter Vitusik on his work on fire trees showing that as a nitrogen fixer on a, on a nitrogen poor <laughs> new island of Hawaii, it was fertilizing the island and changing the entire ecosystem. Um, and also the paper by Jack Ewell on the effect of uh, Melaleuca and Brazilian pepper uh, in Everglades National Park, especially through their uh, change of the, changing the fire regime. Um, and as the sort of house organ of, of um, the National Park Service, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of papers in the, the, the first 15 years or so journal uh, uh, about various impacts of introduced species. I could have genuflected to Jane Lubchenco and added some marine ones, like most recently lionfish has been in the park science. These were um, somewhat more heavily aimed at management than in the academic literature of the time, but some were really about uh, impact and not management, uh, but, but they were they were pretty similar in many ways. And the main way is that all the literature at that time in the first decade or two after the Scope Conference was on the impacts of a particular invader on a particular native species or small group of them. Uh, they could eat, eat them or they could trample them or they could infect them with a disease or they could hybridize with them. But I, I call these like one-on-one -on -one sorts of impacts. Um, and those are the kinds of papers that dominated uh, park science and the academic literature at the time. And I should also at this time point out that the first 10 or 20 years of the journal had uh, a number of really, uh, several people repeatedly published and it too deserve a lot of uh, uh, credit, I think. Susan Bratton and Lloyd Loop published over and over again on plants, on animals, on impact, on how we have to do something. And um, they don't get as much credit, probably because they have no University of California Berkeley um, connection, but people don't know about them. But they are really responsible, I believe, for the, the increasing focus of the Park Service and of the entire uh, academic community on this issue. Um, Beginning in 2002, park science um, became a glossier uh, entity and began occasionally to have uh, theme issues and to aim not just at managers but at the broader public about what the issues are facing the park. And they had a theme issue on invasive species. It was uh, 70 or 80 pages in 2004. That was really um, quite remarkable. It had a lot on management, but also a lot just on the biology of invaders and on so, you know, it, various issues relating to invasion, but not, uh, not management. It could even be a primer in, in invasion biology. Even today it could be. It's a very nice piece of work. Um, okay, so beginning, um, oh, around 2000, the field uh, of of invasion biology evolved quite rapidly in some new directions. Um, the, the original kinds of research that I called you know, one-on-one research uh, continued to be important, but there were two new 
threads. One is, uh, I pointed this paper before, Vitusik's work showing ecosystem-wide impacts of uh, introduced species. He published it in 1986 first, but it didn't catch on until 2000. But then the, uh, many people began to look for that kind of thing, including work in the national parks, other, other nitrogen fixers like black locust in uh, Cape Cod National Seashore. And there were, this was tracked also in park science, a number of papers on ecosystem level impacts. Um, the other new thread was um, uh, the incorporation of evolution and genetics into invasion biology, which for a reason I've never understood, was a lag by about 15 years after the explosion of uh, interest in ecology of them. This was the first monograph, but a lot of work then uh, showing evolutionary impacts of introduced species, fast evolution of the species themselves, uh, hybridization with uh, native species or among different uh, populations of the same introduced species, and often on species of great concern to national parks, like reed canary grass. In this particular case, the, um, uh, it, it didn't really lead to yet to much in the uh, park science. This is the only paper it's on cattails and how the real invasive cattail is basically a hybrid of an introduced and a native species. So, uh, so it hasn't yet filtered into park science, possibly because it's not immediately concerned or doesn't immediately suggest a way to use management. Uh, and this paper does, and maybe there will be others soon. Um, one thing park science doesn't really cover is controversies. There were lots of controversies about managing introduced species. So removing mountain goats, which were introduced to Olympic National Park in around 1920, and uh, there have been persistent controversy about removing them. Several articles in Park Science, none of them mentioning that there's any controversy about it. This is a remarkable one. This is all about how risky it is for the people doing the work to, to have to get them out by helicopter when they could easily shoot them, but it doesn't say why they're doing it, which uh, was because of objections by animal rights groups. Um, ditto for the shooting of the burrows. This is the only article that's even mentioned uh, that there was any controversy about this, but it was even in national newspapers. Uh, here's an example where it, one of the few that did mention controversies. Maybe the most remarkable case is the uh, eradication in 1992 of ship rats from Anacapa in order to uh, uh, reestablish the rookery or maintain the rookery of Zantuz's Merlet primarily. It's a whole novel about it. Maybe some of you have read it. But there were two papers in uh, Park Science. This is by the editor, Selray and the Victory. It's all about how it was done. It was so controversial at the time that there was even uh, an animal rights group tried to sabotage it by dumping huge amounts of vitamin K on the island to counteract the anticoagulant toxin. Um, but it's nothing about the controversy. You know, why? I, I guess maybe one reason really is that the, uh, it's a government document. <laughs> and I guess federal government documents don't like controversy. The other might be that it's, you know, they're very focused, the park managers and scientists, on dealing with this issue. They see a reason to be doing it, and, and they're not going to be moved much by controversy. Um, there are several controversies that have uh, uh, roiled the fields in the last five or so years. Um, um, among the, by, by a small group of what I think are misguided people, uh, Ed Wilson mentioned two of them earlier, Emma Morris, the uh, writer, and uh, Peter Kareva, the chief scientist of Nature Conservancy, are part of this small group. And this hasn't also shown up in park science, even though there are many, many academic articles and meetings about it. I suppose because the policy of the parks is very clear, we're going to keep them out if we can, we're going to try to manage them and reduce them and eliminate them if we can. And I guess to the people doing get arguments about things like uh, xenophobia, et cetera, uh, seem awfully academic. So I'll, I'll mention that, well, I guess I should go back. The, uh, the one that, the, the objection that could be really damaging is the claim that we can't really do anything about it. But we can do something. 
something about it. And the pages of Park Science have many articles about how they've dealt with, dealt, successfully dealt with an invasive species problem. I don't have time to talk about them. Just one example would be Australian paper bark in uh, Everglades National Park and surrounding area. It was long viewed as a hopeless case, very to cover a huge amount of the park, and it's been greatly reduced, and it's continuing to be reduced by a combination of uh, improved technologies. And that's just one of many success stories. Um, so I'll close by talking about the problems today. There, there are in the national park system today uh, about 6,500 non-native species. Undoubtedly, the most famous one is, is the uh, Burmese python, whose arrival in Everglades National Park coincided perfectly with the plummeting of all of the populations of medium size and large size uh, mammals, 90% or more. And so it's having a huge, huge impact. You would not think that there'd be any controversy about trying to keep them from spreading and trying to eliminate them, but our friends in the US Association of Reptile Keepers, I don't know if any of you are here, uh, don't like what the federal government is doing to, to try to cut them back and keep them from spreading. But um, anyway, if this is just uh, for the Everglades, the leading edge of, uh, of lots of invasions. Um, you know, there are, uh, as you can see, somewhere around four or 500 um, established invasive species, some of which are quite consequential, like Old World Climbing Fern. And there are victories. They, I've already talked about Australian paper bark. Australian pine has been quite well managed. Um, but at the same time, there are new ones like the black and white tegu and the python. So it's an ongoing challenge. And I'll finish by uh, turning to a park very, very close to my home, uh, you know, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, an Oriental Bittersweet, which is a, a new invader in the park. Oriental, bitters, Oriental Bittersweet got to, the, um, you, uh, to this region in the mid-1980s and was possibly introduced to the U.S. also by um, Frederick Law Olmsted, the famous landscape architect who was the uh, master architect for the landscaping of both UC Berkeley and Stanford. And he was a real enthusiast of uh, non-native species, as you can tell by walking around the Berkeley campus. Um, and he was the landscape architect for the Biltmore Estate near uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and established a nursery to, for plantings for the, the, um, the Biltmore Estate. And he then uh, allowed the nursery to be used by other people for landscaping. And that's, that's how it all started. The first time it showed up in the park was these two dots in 1994, Fontana Lake was formed when the uh, TVA dammed the Little Tennessee Rick River in 1944, creating a large lake and you know many homes now around the lake, which is what the TVA wanted, actually, and, uh, and near the lake, and many of them are landscaped with uh, exotic plants. So it's not a surprise that this is where it first showed up. Next showed up here, and over the years has um, spread and spread and spread and spread. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and uh, you know, this is where it is now. So it's a, an ongoing battle, but it's, it's been dealt with quite well by the, the park um, uh, scientists and managers. They've eradicated most of these uh, in, in, uh, introductions, and they're on the lookout for new ones, but they know that they're going to be doing this for a long time, maybe in perpetuity, or certainly un until a biocontrol agent is found. And, uh, but the point is most of the park has uh, no invasive species to speak of, and it, so it's, uh, it's only in certain places, and they're working on it. And I guess that's how I'll, I'll end. Uh, you know, their view is that the introduced species are a challenge, a big challenge, uh, but it's one well worth taking on because they see the major impact of many of them. And they, they think they can handle it if they work hard. And that seems to be the message that comes through over and over again in the journal Park Science, that it's not hopeless. We have to try to do it. And if we try, we'll have a lot of success. So thank you. try to keep ourselves on schedule, and I'm going to um, draw on one from the audience.
and my own interests. In a time of climate change, we talk a lot about species shifting, and climate change is anthropogenic. So at what point are species that are responding to climate a human-introduced species? Are they ever non-native? Is this going to blur the line of that baseline? One is, what will happen to non-native species already present? And will range changes be so substantial that they bring a native species into a, an area that's very far from where it had been. And I'm talking only about the non-native ones, the ones that are brought discontinuously from elsewhere. And of course, um, there's now been sufficient research to show that many of them are going to change their ranges in one way or the other. Some will be inhibited by uh, global warming, for example, bat white nose syndrome. But um, the research, I think, shows that more will be facilitated and spread. And, um, it will make it harder for park personnel and others to deal with them. They're non-natives, but as I said, there are successes, there are many successes, and there are new technologies that, that have worked uh, in particular cases, and I think we have to keep trying. With respect to the native species spreading because of climate change, I don't believe they should be managed. Uh, so just to quickly to pursue it, when that discontinuous, is that a clear criterion, you think, that we'll be able to maintain of how far away something came from, to be sure, clear? 99% of the time, we, we, we know, as with Olmsted, you know, it was carried from the old world to here, and there are very few examples where there's uh, really uh, ambiguity about whether it's discontinuous or not. And I, th and I know we'll return to this uh, later in the, in the panel discussion. So... Um, I think at the end, you really characterize some of those arguments of, about the, maybe some of the ambiguity of invasives as, in your view, not ones that are, carry much weight. But if you think about communicating with the general public, and we've talked a lot about the importance of communication, I mean, it does seem that sometimes, how can we, how can we just get out there and say, biodiversity is good except for these? Is there a communication problem that we're not coming to grips with of being able to make both of those statements I think there is a communication problem. Um, and I think most of these, um, almost all of them, except for the objections to management based on animal rights, are, are a question of greater education about the real impacts, the fact that many are, are subtle but nevertheless consequential. We learn more and more about it all the time. We know many of them that are established and don't seem to have an impact for a while and suddenly explode across the landscape for one reason or another. And, and the, the uh, the entire gamut of impacts, ecological impacts, many of which the public does worry about, um, ha have to be made clearer. And I, I don't think we've done a great job of communicating that, but I think it's certainly possible. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we will return to these issues, so everyone keep these questions in mind as we go on to park management questions later in the day. Thank you very much, Dan. Our last speaker before the coffee break is Dr. Joel Berger, professor of wildlife conservation at the University of Montana and a senior scientist with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Joel studies the ecology and conservation of large mammals, and all the wildlife biologists here know that that means bigger than a bread box, I'm told. I am a plant ecologist. Um, I like trees. They're all bigger than bread boxes, too. Uh, he's worked around the world, Africa, Bhutan, Siberia, as well as many, many studies across the Great Basin and the Northern Rockies, including in our uh, Rocky, uh, Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks. He's been a recipient of several Guggenheim Awards, an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and has received Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Society of Conservation Biology and the American Society of Mammalogists. Joel's talk today, and this wins the award for the best title of the day, The Metaphorical Snow Ox. Science and Conservation in Increasingly Populated Parks. Thanks, Joel. So I'd like to begin by um, first thanking um, Dave and Steve on behalf of UC Berkeley. I'd like to thank the Park Service. I'd like to thank uh, National Geographic and KUED. What I'm going to do today is take us, uh, take you through three different vignettes that mix species and theme. And I'm going to start um, at the northwest edge of a continent where National Park Service has a couple of holdings and they um, 
face different kinds of challenges in a very non-peopled part of the US. I'm going to move to a more congested landscape, something where we deal with issues um, on connectivity and movements. And then finally, I'm going to move towards uh, some attempt at dealing with some solutions along the latter topic. Let me begin by saying and, and reflecting a little bit on what I've heard. Certainly, um, parks are relevant to society. They have been relevant. They need to be relevant. There are a lot of future challenges. If we go down the road 10 miles or so, there are different kinds of parks. Parks that will have a very different face for a lot of people that are in this country. Um, and when we think about what these different kinds of parks bring forth, um, they bring forth different kinds of visions. We heard a little bit about economics. We've heard a lot about biodiversity. And at some point, these work together, and at some point, they don't. We do know that when we think about visitation, and John Jarvis talked about this with respect to more sports than I've put up here, but if we take the five major sports and we look at what the total attendance has been a couple of years ago, something like 140 million visitors. We also heard from John that um, twice that number come to national parks. We know that we have crowded playing fields, crowded playing fields in a lot of different arenas. When we think about the lower US, we know that we have issues that deal with increasing populations, increasing challenges, as we've heard from a number of speakers, and also increasing isolation. When we look towards Alaska, we have twice the land mass of national park units, but less than 1% of the visitation. Issues about relevance are important and will continue to grow and to be more important for society. One of the key attractions, and we've heard this multiple times in multiple ways, tend to be wildlife. When we think about an artificial line between economics and biodiversity, and I do say artificial, certainly we know that not only gateway communities in Africa, but also in the US, as well as in Canada, and a number of other parts of the world tend to receive benefits. Um, and these benefits go deep, and they go in a lot of different ways. What I'm going to do today is to talk about a met metaphorical large mammal, uh, the snow oxen. And I will use the snow oxen for different kinds of challenges, challenges that deal with species that roam widely, that require a lot of space, and that run into and encounter conflicts with people, not only on the borders, but beyond. And so I'm going to take us through three different um, parcels, uh, climate, I'll talk about isolation, I'll talk about migration. I think it's important to point out that, um, maybe not for you in the audience, but I think perhaps more generally, um, when we think about conservation, we, have, um, we, we recognize conservation was born as a crisis discipline, but we also have a culture, a culture which tends to look backwards. We ask ourselves, where are the last 50 or 500 best places? Where are the last tigers? Where are the last pandas? And somehow we need to reverse that and be thinking forward. What I also want to do today is to um, be mindful of the NPS diverse missions, which include research, of course, elements that include muddy boots, but bringing this back towards multiple, what multiple speakers have said, towards society. And so of the first vignette, I want to take us to the northwest edge of North America, focus on um, challenges that come with living in Arctic environments and focus on the species at the top of the world, musk oxen. Musk oxen are a misnomer. They're neither makers of musk nor are they oxen, but that's what they're known as. Um, and the question that I want to address first and then work with you through some logic is whether climate change or something else may be affecting species at the edge of its range. And so first the species, because musk oxen, as you'll see here in the uh, very middle of the uh, point towards, um, are the least known large mammal in North America. We don't know much about them. We do know that their closest relative is another alpine or cold adapted obligate mountain goats, feeling the pinch from climate forcing changes as well. Musk oxen are well known behaviorally for an odd type of defense system, herd defense. They don't run, they bond, bond, uh, form um, 
collective herds. Uh, these are uh, what they're protecting, oftentimes, youngsters. Uh, males buffeted, um, one on the left, one on the right, female in the center for sexual dimorphism. And potential predators in the system, traditionally uh, wolves, sometimes grizzly bears, and perhaps a new member on the block, polar bears. I'll come back to that. So when we look at the range of musk ox, there are a lot of reasons to think that they would be heat um, intolerant, and physiological studies certainly confirm that. So what I want to do is just to fall back and go a little bit deeper on persistence in demography, looking at populations here labeled A, B, and C. A and B are NPS units. C is U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, also called Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. When we do this, note that A and B um, differ in trajectories. A has a high rate of population growth across 30 to 40 years. B is reasonably stable, now declining. C, Arctic Refuge, has pretty much collapsed. So what I'm going to do is to capitalize on the variation between A and B here and ask just some fundamental applied questions. Well, why do they vary? Climate or something else? How would we know? And so in terms of structuring hypotheses, the only one that I'll touch on today is food shown on your bottom left. Methods, uh, reasonably invasive for the first four years of our work. We've radio collared more than 200 animals. I've worked with Lane Adams of USGS during those four years gather a lot of physiological information, body mass, other kind of life history, uh, and, and direct metrics. But since then, we've gone towards non-invasive approaches, far less impacting um, on the species, less impacting on the biologist doing the study, and less bureaucracy for NPS. Um, I'll point out that we do fecal assessments, so we can uh, look at pregnancy. We use DNA to segregate males from females. We've also been focused on stress hormones. In addition to this, we've been doing photo imaging. And so below the tepid sun, you'll see a herd of musk ox. On the far left of your screen, you'll see a human approaching. We need to be within about 40 meters to get photogrammetric um, shots, which will be accurate, which allow us then to um, project the head sizes of the animals. We can look at incremental changes across years, just as uh, plant ecologists, some plant ecologists will use tree rings to look at abiotic drivers uh, as well. So, um, again, where I'm going with this, why did the two populations vary? Uh, Non-invasive follow-up, usually in the winter time, uh, lots of cold weather gear, um, different than here in Berkeley. Uh, so testing a food hypothesis. If, and I say if, nutrition is constraining one population than another relative to the other, what we could do is make some predictions. The predictions would be that there were differences in body size, differences in condition, differences in pregnancy, um, differences potentially in body mass. So what do we know? So if we look at these metrics on the left, if we look at the direction, I'll just read no, not really, no, no. All right, so what am I saying? Food is probably not limiting. What are other factors? Well, adult survival could be. Notice on the bottom left, the grizzly bear. That bear is on top of a musk ox. If you look at the collar, the collar is shredded. That animal did not die a peaceful death. But if we look at the differences between the two populations, no difference. OK, so not adult survival, not food. What about juvenile recruitment? OK, so thinking about juvenile recruitment, what we have is a situation here shown in brown and in white uh, or gray. Yes, consistent differences, um, strong differences. What are the causes? What are the factors that contribute potentially most? Well, I want to focus on an interaction between predation and bring in a human effect, an indirect human effect. That is that with human harvest, we have an increasing asymmetry in sex ratios, adult sex ratios. And this may have an effect on social structure or on juvenile recruitment. How might this be working? Here's an adult male, adult female. What happens when males aren't in groups? So if males are playing a strong role, what we could do is we could suggest that maybe groups with and without males vary in terms of how they are going to respond, and maybe this triggers a difference in predation by grizzly bears. So let's go back to natural history. On top of this hill, we have a musk oxen group with three new um, offspring, babies. Um, here, working on the uh, below, 
Uh, I'll enhance this. Five grizzly bears working their way up to the top of the hill. We can't see these interactions. You know, we don't have the advantages that some of the, um, the people who gather really hard-earned data in Yellowstone, but we can't do this kind of study in the Arctic, nor as is done in Serengeti. So what we're doing is we're using animal models to get a better handle as to what may be going on in these systems. Um, what we're doing is using a bear model. What we're also doing is using a caribou model. I will point out, because people are chuckling, that uh, uh, two Nobel Prize laureates won um, uh, in animal behavior because they used animal models, Nico Tinberg and Conrad Lorenz. So just I'm following, in, so, and all of us who do behavioral ecology follow in good footsteps. Okay, uh, <laughs> there's my play. All right, so, um, okay, so we're doing models, and what we have at this point, uh, I'll come back in a few years, it's slow going. Let me sum up where we're at with respect to this. No evidence for food limitation. We've used remote sensing. We continue to do it. It's a good way to dovetail what we're learning and finding, but it's not in and of itself a good substitute for being on the ground and for understanding interactions. And then finally, I'll say that despite the remoteness, there is a human role potentially, and we don't know, and we're trying to cement that. But so thinking about this from a park service perspective, we don't know the science. Oftentimes, in so many systems, we're not going to have the best scientific knowledge, but we need to think forth how we go forward. So what I want to do is turn where we don't know the science from a not a crowded landscape to move into my second vignette, where we have better idea of the science and where we understand a little bit more what's going on with respect to humans and habitat challenges, and focus on park size and park size constraints. Of course, we have hard edges, park boundaries, uh, the one for Yellowstone, Targhee National Forest adjacent to it, Santa Monica Mountains um, National Recreation Area with the LA Basin unfolding. Key challenges, we've heard about some of these. I think Monica Turner mentioned a couple, wide-ranging species, park units. So the issue is, what does the science tell us about disconnected mammals? If we think about isolation, we think about population viability, I'll first focus in Florida, think about road systems, think about Florida cougar, and based on um, what's been known for, uh, for quite a while, but a recent paper also points now to morphological anomalies, kink tails. Um, this could be a good surrogate as a fitness measure. Um, it's an indirect measure, but it's certainly uh, illustrative of genetic problems. We can go to something that is fully connected, most of our bison populations. What we know from probably the most inbred population, that in Badlands National Park without founders for 80 years, five individuals born missing different limbs. Um, so lots of different issues. When I ask when's the last time we've seen a three-legged wildebeest, we certainly can see three-legged bison, but not three-legged wildebeest. What we know, of course, is that for large species, bigger than a bread box, uh, there are challenges um, by reserve size. So for my last vignette, what I want to do is just to say, we know some of the science, uh, isolation creates issues. The question is, what do we do about these issues? And so what I want to do is to focus on connectivity. I'm going to go back uh, and deal uh, in a system that I've worked in for about a dozen years, the Greater Yellowstone, talk about long distance migration, and ask about migration beyond parks. This is not a good sign. Um, unlike Ernesto, I'm going to wait for a second. Sorry, Steve. Okay, regional setting, regional set setting. We're gonna focus Grand Teton National Park. Um, on your left, um, um, in black, are the migration routes. If we go across the last 75 years, what we've seen is the collapse of most migration routes. We call the one remaining route, Path of the Pronghorn. What we've seen is the collapse of many of the routes. And so the question becomes, the question becomes, how do we protect this last critical corridor?
How do we understand the needs from an animal perspective? Not a person perspective, but an animal perspective. We let the animals define the route for us. These routes uh, include multiple bottlenecks. One is called the Red Hills bottleneck, where every animal in the population moves through this soccer field that's two uh, soccer fields wide, every single animal. The migration route is 240 miles round trip, some animals 400 miles round trip. It's the longest in the lower 48. The animals leave Park Service lands, traverse Forest Service lands, traverse the hallmark of America, private lands, and then Department of Interior BLM lands. So our approach has been to build support, to bring messages to the local people, but we also are mindful that we have to um, publish our work, have a seat at the table as a scientist, but we've garnered local attention so that the local people realize the treasure that is in their backyard. We've worked with Smithsonian and National Geographic to help move um, the uh, message a little bit broader, as has David Quammen, uh, working with John Francis. Um, we've had op-eds in the New York Times. We've had county support. We've worked with business communities, letters to the governor, met with the governor, and then um, in 2008, Dirk Kempthorne, then of course under the uh, George W. Um, Bush uh, administration with uh, an illustration of bipartisan support indicated that there was a more than a million dollars to be dedicated to this. And so thinking beyond NPS and park superintendents work covertly and overtly with us to step beyond their formal boundaries to make this happen. But partnering and thinking about a national conservation strategy is probably pretty incumbent if we want to hit some of the goals that E.O. Wilson was talking about earlier. Private lands, a huge component. We're not going to solve things unless we work with private lands. So my point today is that we can take science to conservation. Conservation challenges mean people and partner challenges. Now the last thing that I want to say, and this is something that only came up I think with Monica, um, is that the park can also serve as, uh, the NPS does serve as ambassadors in other parts of the world. And so thinking about the Beringia program, look at, uh, oh no, all right. Um, can we do anything else? Ooh, good, okay. You are earning your money. Good job, <laughs> good job, thank you. Uh, Wrangell Island, Russia. So we've been working over there and we talk about climate changes, we talk about novel ecosystems. What seems to be going on there? More polar bears on land. We spent February, March, and parts of April there last year. And what we were able to do is to document polar bear predation on musk oxen. And so we've got the makings of a lot of different issues. This is Park Service comparative studies, but maybe another message is that we can use science as an ambassador because despite Crimea, despite Ukraine that was unfolding when we were there, both the US government and the Russian government said, let's let these projects continue. And so when I think about the relevance of parks, I think about challenges, I think about making them relevant to future generations, I think about boots on the ground to try to inspire people to gain a seat at the table, and then I think about importance from many of the issues that we've heard from other people. So thanks a lot. So in dealing with all the partners you described, and especially if you have cases where you might encounter opposition, at least initially, to some of the conservation outside the parks, is it the science that is the compelling argument to a broader audience, or is it some version of the science translated into maybe some other terms? I think. Can you grab this? Too? You need your mic. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the messaging that comes in this case with migration not calling it ecological phenomena, but talking about migration of something in somebody's backyard is pretty important, especially pointing out that in the Western Hemisphere, in this case, the pronghorn issue, between the Canadian border and the tip of Patagonia, there is no other mammal that migrates further. So 
making it a gee whiz, something that they should care about, is important. But building bonds, knowing that people aren't going to get screwed by having some environmental guy or you know somebody who's not part of their town coming in and talking, and realizing that we can count on people and that people are people, I think that the human touch is pretty important. Partnership, and I know that NPS certainly extends in a lot of the places that I've worked to the communities outside the parks. And then going to the other end, in terms of the legislation behind this kind of conservation, the early legislation around migratory organisms was for birds, which could get from here to there on their own. Is there a, is there a gap there in terms of the kinds of authority that's needed to handle these long-range migratory mammal species? I, I think the ones that are most off the radar right now are marine mammals. I mean, certainly people who work on marine mammals are on the radar, but I don't think the public, you know, people think about bats, they think about birds, they think about monarch butterflies, they might think about bison or wildebeest or, you know, maybe pronghorn, but off the radar are uh, so much that are occurring in marine systems. And I think that, you know, moving that up is also a way to get a lot of people excited. Well, this continues us on our theme about how parks are embedded in these very large landscapes. Uh, we've slid a little bit behind, so just before we stop here, we're going to slide five minutes later on the schedule. It gives you a, maybe a slightly curtailed coffee break, and we ask you to please be back at 3.15. Thank you very much, Joel. Thanks.